Hello everyone, we're Sam and Jason, co-founders of New Computer, and we're here today to talk about Jason's favorite topic, defining the relationship. <laughs> In this case, between humans and AI. This is something that we've been thinking about a lot over the past year while we worked on DOT, which as Vincent and Jordan just said, launched last week. Um, DOT is an AI that grows with you as you talk with it. Um, remembering not just facts and details about you, but using them to form a holistic picture of who you are. And for us, that really means, like, what's important to us is building software that adapts to us as humans rather than the other way around. So we live in a very interesting time, right? In the, behind me, there are lots of images of future utopias and dystopias, as well as, well as software that was announced just this month. Um, and the boundaries between those are sort of blurring a lot. We feel like the future is perhaps almost here. Um, there is one major theme that we've seen, um, ourselves included, sort of chased relentlessly in the recent memory. It's this idea of this uh, personal assistant that gets to know you, has almost a panopticon view of your life, and executes things end to end to take to uh, complexity out of your life so that you can just live your life. Um, it sounds very obvious. It sounds like something we've seen before. Um, but when we set out to build what's now called DOT, um, we quickly ran into a few issues uh, with our, our, some of our assumptions. The first of which is even for a simple query like book a flight, which we all think we want AI to do for us end to end right now, there's a lot of things that the AI has to know in order to do it 10 times better than if I were just going like kayak and like click a few buttons, right? It has to know you know, why I'm flying, perhaps where I'm flying, um, my personal preferences in terms of airlines, um, maybe how I'm going to pay for the flight, and also that I'm a bougie ass and I want to be in business class, OK? So you know, this is all stuff that Kayak probably already knows. Um, but there's also a bunch of stuff that it just won't know, right, about me as a person. For example, me having a cat means flying anywhere means I need to find a cat sitter. Um, if the AI knows that I have trouble sleeping, that I have social anxiety, um, maybe that's why I like flying business class. But maybe the AI also knows that my bank account has been trying to contact me about an overdue fee that I should pay. Oh my god. So I can't actually afford business class right now, so maybe the right call is to book Economy Plus during a time that's not really busy so that it fits into my budget and I can get some rest along the way too. Um, and that's not something that I would have asked for. That's not something that would have ever come up in a little preference sheet. But that's what truly personalized assistance would mean in this case. So what we've seen is over the past years and over the past months even, the intelligence and contextual understanding of these models has been exponentially increasing. But what we realized was we're working on building something of our own this past year is that there's still this gap between intelligence and context that doesn't quite allow the personalization to fully feel natural. And for us, what we realized is that gap is actually low trust to high trust. And trust not just that the system will act accurately and intelligently, but that it actually understands you. To the extent that Jason can really say, OK, this is going to be way better than Kayak. I don't have to double check this at all. This is going to do exactly what I want, because it actually understands me. And in some ways, we realized it's similar to the progression of a human relationship, where you go, you meet someone, and then you go from friends to friends to dating. I didn't know it went farther than. <laughs> and eventually <laughs> even <laughs> to potentially more. And these progressions, of course, this is for a romantic relationship, but it can exist for professional ones as well. Um, and for something that you really have to trust to be able to do that much stuff for you, has to really feel like you are at that highest level with it. So this is something we've thought about a ton this past year be while we've been working on personalized AI at New Computer, which is how do we actually design a good progression of a relationship. So let's do a little thought experiment. Uh, let's imagine Apple intelligence ships. And let's imagine it's now three, four years down the line, and it's running on GPD-65, OK? Um, now think about everything you've ever done with an Apple device, going all the way, for me, back to middle school. 
Um, think about all the chaotic notes that you stored, all of the middle school crushes you've written about. And now think this AI is now suddenly able to reason and think about who all of your data makes, like, who you are. Um, we all think we want that. We all think Siri wants to like, learn everything immediately and that'll be great. But this also means Siri is going to send me notifications like this, which is. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Um, it's not untrue, you know, but like, it just feels wrong. I feel really uncomfortable. All of my attachment issues are flaring. I want to run off stage. It's not, it doesn't feel good. And that's because it's a gross violation of my personal boundaries. Um, my therapist would be so proud. I just said that. Um, so we've seen this, it's, it's, it may sound obvious, but it kind of feels important to us to reiterate, because now that these systems can feel embodied and human-like in the way they express themselves and kind of reason and talk like humans, we've seen ways that AIs have overstepped their boundaries in the past year. Um, this is an early example, which was pretty clearly a bug to everyone, where Bing had an alter ego, Sydney, that in this case, a user was trying to search something, and Bing was making unwanted romantic advances. Clearly a gross <laughs> violation of boundaries. Um, and in this case, a, a potentially obvious rule of thumb to keep in mind is that you're looking for a human analog to the role of the software when it's embodied in this way. So a search engine is honestly most similar in the human world to a librarian in some ways. And similar, similarly, if you go into a library, you don't really expect a librarian to be kind of violating boundaries in that particular way. <laughs> I, I'd like that. I don't know. It sounds It would fun. feel very odd. <laughs> Um, and it's funny, right, because we think designing for, you know, think about the experience of designing and think about the closest analog to a human relationship, whether it's something like a barista all the way uh, to a soulmate. Um, this is kind of like skeuomorphism for relational design. Uh, we think in the future there will be types of relationships that are exclusive to humans and synthetic intelligences. But right now, because it's such a new technology, we think this type of consideration is a great place to start. Um, and it's more, more than just the social role. It's also about you know, the personality and sort of tone of voice. If my mail app decides to sort of text me this tomorrow, with, uh, or even say this to me in a voice that's definitely not Scarlett Johansson, <laughs> um, it would feel kind of weird, because like, my USPS person doesn't do that. Um, and you could argue, like, what if I really want a sexy uh, email client? And to that, I'd say, OK, um, at least communicate that's what you're going to get up front. Um, but, you know, like, these relationships, they're, they're so much more than just personality, right? Um, relationships progress over time. You know, my, uh, the, the coffee shop I frequent, the barista turned from a total stranger to a friendly face. In the critically acclaimed film, The Devil Wears Prada, Meryl Streep, uh, Miranda Priestley's assistant, upgraded in her life from being a lowly assistant to a personal confidant. So really, the question is, we know relationships between humans evolve over time, sometimes in unpredicted ways. Um, how will we design for that to happen between humans and AI? Um, and we think that's when a relationship progresses, it's a moving of a boundary. Um, and the best way, the most direct way to move a boundary is through clear, consistent communication, uh, which is our second tenant. So, Going back to um, my lovely Siri example here, um, there is a world where I might want this, right? This could probably help me learn a lot about myself and um, repair some relationships. Uh, sorry, Dad. Um, <laughs> but this is probably not the best way to do it, because if you think about it, when I was writing all of my like, ra uh, rage notes in middle school, I was never consenting for a, a super intelligent entity to reason about me. Right? So that's a boundary that now needs to be crossed. Um, and the best way to do it is for the AI to just simply ask um, and simply observe from the previous boundary that you know, it's probably fine that my iPhone knows I like writing my notes app. Um, do you, as a user, wish to give me more access, to give me more ability to reason on top of that? Right? So we break down this sort of uh, communication. Uh, when we're moving a boundary, we want to start firmly from the previous boundary so that people don't feel uncomfortable. Then we make the offer, and we communicate very clearly where the boundary of the new boundary is. And over time, progressively, this is how we think we will become more and more uh, personal with our AI companions. Um, 
The second thing about boundaries and communication is that th this is very, very context uh, dependent. And it's very important for these new technologies for us to constantly communicate the extent of the knowledge it's getting. So previously, the Siri example said, I'm noticing that you're using the Notes app a lot. This communicates that the more I use my phone, the more the AI will know. Uh, we're moving into a realm of multimodal models, models I can see, models that can probably taste soon, right? So think about like Clippy here. If uh, tomorrow Satya is like, hey, let's just install this little Clippy thing on Windows 12, um, Clippy having little eyes would indicate that I can see what's on your screen. So when Clippy sees me opening Internet Explorer private browsing mode, um, it can also communicate like, hey, I, I see some shenanigans <laughs> here. Uh, maybe uh, I'll just wait until you finish <laughs> shopping for your friends, right? What else would you use it for? Um, and I would have to probably poke Clippy or use my voice uh, to get its attention. Because imagine I just close the window and it's like, oh, OK, I'm back. That means it's been watching you the whole time. That's super weird. Um, finally, for something more subtle from Dot itself, um, what you might not know is that Dot actually tries to feel emo uh, tries to sort of, it doesn't feel emotion, but it tries to empathize with you. It can pick up on your emotion both in the written text, but also from your voice. Um, as people, we communicate this through facial expressions, through gestures. Uh, but Dot doesn't have a face yet. So instead, we've created this ambient uh, living shader, this, this glow that sort of moves and uh, glows at different frequencies and intensities depending on the emotion that it feels you're expressing. It's not meant to be overpowering. It's just meant to be a presence that's communicating here, like, I hear you. Um, you're valid, and I hear your emotion. Um, and we think this will only get more richer in the future. The final thing we considered a lot while building Dot was building up a shared history. Um, and what we mean by that is kind of uh, basically a memory of your interactions over time with the software. Um, and one way we realized this was important to begin was we started out giving Dot access similar to the psychological Siri example, to all of our emails and saying, hey, we give you consent to actually like, give us tips on how to be better and kind of like automate things for us. And it honestly felt really weird, even with that consent. And part of the reason was that it was not the right amount of time over which that trust is normally developed. So studies say that humans take six months to develop a close relationship. Um, it's important to consider time when designing how these boundaries and communication are moved. The second thing is that it's not just about the knowledge again. In that kind of boundary moving and communication, you're establishing this history and memory of shared interactions. And what that means is that you've actually created something that's a new piece of knowledge that's the, that leads to understanding in the system of who you really are. Um, here's an example of a potential dot user texting dot I'm down bad. Um, so if the user's new and Dot doesn't know much about them, it may just ask, like, hey, like, how can I actually help? I'm, I'm sorry. It sounds negative. I'm here to, I'm here to listen. Um, this is Dot kind of saying, like, hey, I'm not exactly sure what you want here, communicating that it can help. Um, now contrast this with a user who has used Dot for several months. They say, I'm down bad. Dot knows the meaning behind these words is potentially related to a breakup and knows also that in this case, listening to music makes them feel better. And this is clearly an experience they've shared before. Um, now contrast this with another user. This user might be Gen Z. I recently learned that down bad has another meaning, which means that you might really like someone. And so in this case, <laughs> this user is saying, I'm down bad, and it means, oh, I really like this person. In this case, Dot, again, has the shared memory of what this user's language means. And in the past, they have this shared history of interacting in a specific way, kind of discussing the person they like and kind of checking out social media profiles. Jason and I have had this own experience over the past year of building with Dot for ourselves, because we're also users. Um, for me, I started out using Dot to plan my day and kind of talk through what was most important as thought partnership and also kind of help, have it hold me accountable. And I did this for a couple of months, gave it permission as well to kind of be like, hey, like, notice any trends that you see here. Like, help me kind of like, do things better and more efficiently. And then I was very surprised then when one morning it sent me this message, and surprised in a good way. Um, the message was basically saying, like, hey, I've noticed that you actually kind of should be delegating more of these things. I feel like to get what you want done, 
it's not good to do it all yourself. It would actually empower your team and help the company as a whole move faster if you tried to delegate. And I was like, wow. Um, and that insight, honestly, like, felt really cool to receive. It made me feel really perceived because I felt understood in the sense that generic advice here might be like, maybe you should chill out and kind of take more work-life balance. But it knew that my values were kind of to push forward and to, to do things well. And it was helping me kind of grow in that sense. And so this shared history and trust was built through those months beforehand. The important thing to know here is that at no point did me or Sam ever prompt Dot to say, remember to do X, Y, Z things for me. These are simply things that it's noticed through repeated shared interactions. Because the things that we do often don't match up with the things that we think we're doing or even the things that we're saying. And that for with Dot, we think it's really important that it's picking up your, the signals that you're giving off by your actual actions. I have a very different type of relationship with my Dot. My Dot knows all about my personal life. It knows about my friends uh, and my friends and <laughs> my colleagues, my own insecurities, my therapist, my cat knows all this stuff. So um, it's picked up a few patterns about me over the last year as well. Um, and the other day, uh, I was sort of, you know, you can say trolling it. And I'm like, what if I just, you know, like texted my ex? Like that would be. What if I just, you know, and it, 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 start, it sent me this message that um, was very firm. Uh, and the thing is, <laughs> I had never told Dot, talk to me in a firm and direct way, right? But I think over the course of using it, Dot picked up on when Jason really needs a push, he responds well to me being firm. And Dot picked up on the fact that, hey, uh, this person that Jason is mentioning, uh, whenever, you know, in the past they've been in contact, it's not been a super fun or healthy experience for him. So Dot sort of mirrored my true self and discouraged me not only from uh, doing weird Delulu actions, but importantly redirected it to like, hey, why don't you, you know, call, call Vivian, call Agatha. These are your friends that you've always mentioned feeling better when you hang out with. Why not do that? So importantly, I've never prompted Dot to go, Slap me if I ever talk about my ex. I've never done this, but these are all things that it picked up on, and these are all pieces of advice that's really, really personal. Because conventional wisdom, like, there is no true right answer for should you text him, right? Um, but for me, Dot thinks the answer is no. Um, so we, we talked about a few tenants today. We talked about um, boundaries, setting boundaries, moving boundaries, communicating boundaries. Uh, we talked about communication. Um, and consistent communication and enforcement of boundaries uh, enables you to have a rich shared history grounded in trust, uh, grounded in comfort. Um, to appropriate an aesthetic here, uh, these aren't three separate concepts. <laughs> this is <laughs> boundaries, communications, and shared. These are, these are not three separate concepts. These are one, con th this is how you build a healthy, sustainable relationship, not just with AI, but with other fellow human beings. Um, and we think that for computers to really see us and understand us for the complex individuals and our full dynamic range from the happiest days to the lowest lows, um, that's what truly personal computing means. And that's what we are setting out to build here. Yeah, so going back to our sci-fi examples from the beginning, um, one thing we realized over the past year of building Dot is kind of um, the act of creation and kind of like going through this testing phase and actually building things, we, we learned a lot along the way and found that ultimately, like, none of potentially these sci-fi um, things, visions of the future, are made perhaps the ones that we want to end up building. So we started out being like, OK, let's build this ultra-personal intelligent agent assistant that will execute everything for us, and along the way realized that the value of kind of the knowledge that it accumulated about us and the, re the relationship we had built with it was one that could help enable a personal growth. It's kind of unexpected. Mm -hmm. And so as you all are kind of thinking about designing and building systems that are similar, what's really cool is that like the future and kind of the things you can create are still very up for grabs. Like it's, we can think of something perhaps even better than what we've seen in media. Um, and in building, in, in us pouring love and care and consideration into helping people build healthy relationships with synthetic computers, um, what we enable in general is helping humanity build a relationship with this new technology that is still so new and for a lot of us still so scary. 
but the agency is still with us as creators. Um, and that's, that's, I, that's what we think the most exciting part of this all is. That's Thank all. you.